Okay, Jamashi, Nepal home team. Thank you so much for your prayers. God made it clear as to why we were undergoing so much spiritual warfare. And last week we were talking about warfare in our message as well as what, you know, those guys were going through. We saw over 600 patients over the past three days. Can you imagine that? In three days, over 600 uh, patients. Uh, this is the most patients we've ever seen. I normally print out 600 intake cards for our medical clinics before we leave. It was so busy that Eve had to make cards by hand. The crowd was a bit overwhelming, but God is amazing and his work is definitely not done yet. The village chief in Bertie and the local government officials uh, were wonderful and encouraging. I'll tell you more later. Uh, the medical part of our team, Dr. Lyle, Dr. Cliff, Dr. Gabby, Kyle, and Dr. Uh, Sharishti, uh, just left Gorka to travel back to Kathmandu with one of our Nepal drivers named Dev Dr. Rabindra is traveling by motor motorcycle uh, to his home in Pokhara. Medical team is absolutely amazing and the sense of family that the team has is incredible. I can't believe that they're leaving already. I will elaborate more later when we all get home. Please pray for traveling mercies as they head back. The Hawaii part of the medical team has a day layover in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, please keep them in prayer. The camp part of our team, Eli, Daniel, Lorelai, Eve, and me, will be heading to Chitwan tomorrow morning. Eli, Jomesh, Diraj, and Daniel were asked to teach at a leadership camp there, and Lorelai, Eve, and I are assisting. Please pray for traveling mercies. God's word to be spoken clearly for the energy, discernment, wisdom, and love for everyone there. Please pray that God continues to speak to and work on each person uh, individually. We're going to have a hard time getting Lorelai and Daniel back home. They have become, well, when I read that, I said, oh, okay, let me uh, <laughs> say what's happening here, okay. Uh, they've become totally Nepali and are eating little frogs uh, called pain that they caught and killed with rocks in the Durandi River. The Raja's dad gutted the frogs and his mom made soup out of them. Lorelai has already stated that she is staying here. Uh, we're going to have to drag them home. Uh, for those of you who know Lorelai, she's a very picky eater. Uh, for her to catch, uh, kill, and eat frogs is a huge deal. Dr. Gabby is worried about them catching salmonella. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Uh, I ate one of them and it actually tastes pretty good. <laughs> I will tell you more about the crazy adventures later. I'm not allowed to email you very many pictures right now, but I will as soon as we can. I also cannot elaborate on how much, how, how very much now, uh, but the team will once, uh, once all of us get back home. I have, okay, um, anyway. Uh, continue to pray for the team and we've asked you over the last two weeks to pray for them daily and uh, praise the Lord God has been gracious and has answered your prayers the team gets back tomorrow so uh, they get back tomorrow morning and uh, we'll bring them home from the airport and uh, next Sunday we will hear from the team let's go ahead and pray for them now uh, join with me as we uh, pray for our team as they head back uh, get ready to head back Jesus all the glory to you we give you praise and glory for what you are doing. And we acknowledge that there is absolutely nothing that we can do apart from you. So we pray, Lord, over the team as they head back. Uh, and uh, we pray for traveling mercies. You keep them safe. And we look forward to hearing all the stories, all the things, not that they did, but it's what you did up there through them. And so we pray, Lord, again, uh, over the team. Thank you for the victories. Thank you for uh, all the accomplishments that was done. And we pray that your will would be done, Lord, as you bring them back. So we thank you for all the wonderful things that have taken place. In Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, as we get into your word now, we pray you would open up your truth of your word to our hearts. Help us to not hear from anybody but the Holy Spirit. Bring conviction and compel us, Lord, uh, to continue to live our lives uh, for you. Uh, transform us, make us into more like you. And I pray that everyone would hear from you today before we leave and make us uh, 
touched by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, open your Bibles. Acts 14. We're going to continue where we left off as Pastor Eli is moving us through the book of Acts. Again, we're about midpoint, uh, 28 chapters, and we're in chapter 14. Last week, we covered the first seven verses. And today, we will finish the chapter, starting in verse 8 uh, through 28. So, let's uh, dig right in. Okay, um, starting right there in verse 8. And then Lystra, a certain man, without strength in his feet, was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. All right. There, in your bulletin there is an outline if you pull up your outline I'll give you some background as to where we are okay um, there's a map on the back let's start with that we're going to identify four cities and uh, in, in the rest of chapter 14 we will work with these four cities Antioch and Iconium all right you see that there and from there we're going to see some people moving from these two cities into Lystra all right and uh, the Acts of the Apostles, when I think of the book of Acts, I just think of action. Okay, so you've got people who are called by God. This is the first century. Uh, Jesus has already ascended. The Holy Spirit has come upon his apostles. These guys are going from city to city to spread the gospel. But as they move through, there's things happening. All right? It's... Gospel gets out, but there's opposition and there's spiritual warfare. And we took a look at that last week. We'll see some more of that uh, today. So from Antioch and Iconium, we'll see them moving into Lystra. And from Lystra, we see the apostles moving into Derby, And that will take us uh, at the end of 14. Okay, so just to kind of get your bearings, uh, keep the, uh, just keep that map uh, with you. Now on the outline, today we're going to take a look at... Um, Primarily three sections, okay? The first one is there's idolatry taking place at Lystra. Uh, the second section we'll look at is the stoning escape to Derby, and, and the third section is strengthening the converts. Uh, and so we'll look at idolatry, we'll look at suffering, and we'll look at spreading the gospel, and then finally uh, the mission report, okay? So you have your outline there, and let's continue in the text. And so we're starting in Lystra right there in verse 8. And then as the apostles are there, they notice a man <clears throat> without strength in his feet. This guy was lame from birth. It wasn't like uh, he was born uh, physically fine and then got into an accident or something. So from birth, everybody knew. So when, you, when, you have, when you're crippled from birth, everybody knows that you were born that way. All right. So that's an important observation. And because he's never walked right there in verse 8. And all of a sudden, as Paul is speaking, they, Paul is observing intently and seeing that this crippled man has faith. And he says in a loud voice, Paul, because as he's speaking to the crowd, he notices one guy has faith, has faith to be healed. And Paul calls out to him, Stand up on your feet. Stand straight up on your feet. And all of a sudden, the guy leaped and he started walking. Now, if you was there and you knew this guy was born crippled, and all of a sudden you see the guy leaping and walking around, that is something amazing. That is not natural. That is not normal. That is, that's a miracle. All right? So let's continue to see what kind of actions are taking place, right? The book of Acts. So verse 11. Now when the people saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the in Lyconium language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Zeus and they called Paul Hermes because he was a chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen, garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. All right, so what's happening in this part? 
all of a sudden they see a miracle and the people are astonished. So what is the conclusion? The people who, who witness this are drawing their own conclusions that Paul and Barnabas must be gods. Because who can heal somebody who we've known from birth, been crippled, all of a sudden the guy is walking around, not only walking, he's leaping, right? And so they, they draw their own conclusions. These guys are gods, Zeus and Hermes. Now, where did Zeus and Hermes come from, right? Well, you gotta understand, in, in, back in those days, this is the first century, the people there were not saved. They were very suspicious people. And there were actually, um, you know, some legends about gods coming down in the form of mortals. And, um, you know, and so Zeus and Hermes were gods coming in the form of mortals. This is the, uh, the legend that they had. So with them being superstitious, they just says, all right, these are the gods. And they started to worship these guys. All right, so Paul and Barnabas are called by the Holy Spirit to go and spread the gospel. And they're in their first or four or three missionary journeys. And all of a sudden, you got these people worshiping them. What does Paul and Barnabas do? Look at 14. But, okay, and every time you see the word but, it's like hold everything, something's about to change, right? But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes, they ran among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all these things that are in them. And so Paul and Barnabas set these guys straight from the beginning. And they said, hey, wait a minute. We're not, we're not gods. We're, you know, we have the same nature as you guys. So what is it in the Christian church as leaders? What is the proper way to view uh, your leaders. Well, the book of Hebrews chapter 13 actually gives us some clear direction. Uh, in verse seven, it says, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. In verse 17, it says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive that they watch, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. So it's interesting that God, the Holy Spirit has called Paul and Barnabas to go and do ministry. And as they're doing ministry, you got these people worshiping them as if they're gods. And, and Paul and Barnabas sets them straight and says, hey, we're not gods. We've got the same nature as you. And so even in the church, we've got to be careful that your leaders and pastors are definitely men who are called by God to serve, to lead. And the proper way to view them is to honor them and obey your leaders, not to worship them as gods because pastors and leaders have the same nature as you. What we see here is um, an idol. It was idol worship. These guys were worshiping these two men as idols. All right, let's finish up the text there. Verse 16, who in bygone generations allowed the nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. I mean, so these guys, even after Paul and Barnabas set them straight, say, hey, we're not gods. We got the same nature as you guys. Those guys were just still offering sacrifices to these two guys and worshiping them. All right, so the problem here that we see is idolatry. And that's why that section is titled Idolatry Taking Place Here at Lystra. Well, let's talk about the idolatry. And let's talk about the problem of idols and idolatry even in our own lives, all right? Definition of an idol. I have that there on your outline. An idol is anything that competes with God for your heart's affection. All right, let's think about that. The greatest commandment, okay, there is a great commandment is what? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God 
with what? All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Right? That is the first and greatest commandment. And we as a church, we as Christians, need to honor that commandment. That is the great commandment. We need, God has to be number one. If God is not number one in our life, you got an idol. There is only one throne on your heart and only one person can sit on it. If something is sitting on the throne of your heart other than God himself, you've got an idol that you are worshiping. All right? Now there are dozens of kinds of idols that could sit on that throne. I mean, all kinds of stuff, right? And by definition, it's anything that competes for the, for the affection of God. If you don't love God with all your heart, and if God is not your number one, then you've got an idol problem. The enemy knows how to derail God's people. And one of the ways that he does it is to put something else on the throne. We saw that in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say, nah, you eat this fruit, you're going to be like God. And it appealed to man and his nature. And all of a sudden they felt like, hey, we can be just like God. I don't need to submit and yield. I can be just like God. Hey, that, that, that was appealing to the flesh. And so they looked and they ate. But how did that happen? It happened by a temptation. The enemy uses temptations in our lives to lure us so that we see something and he uses the mind as our battlefield and all of a sudden we buy into the appeal because the enemy is going to appeal he, he's not going to come and say hey, you know this thing is bad news or whatever no he's going to tell you he's going to take the truth and twist it he's going to appeal to your flesh and when you give in and listen to the lies of the enemy you are beginning to be lured uh, by this temptation the interesting thing about idols is that it over promises and under delivers every idol that you have given yourself to has over promised you and has always under delivered I'm going to give you two examples of idols out there okay like I said there's dozens and I don't know what's in your heart and I, and sometimes I don't even know what's in my heart okay but we need the Holy Spirit to examine our lives so that we can come to the truth because the enemy is a deceiver. Two examples of idols. One is money, the other is sex. And let's talk about these two, okay? Because these two obviously has ruined people from the beginning of time, right? And, and all of us are susceptible to those. Two examples. This past week we had an opportunity to see the movie Gosnell. Uh, there was only a few of uh, actually two families from our church you guys got to see the movie when it comes out it's eye-opening uh, for me when I saw the movie it just conjured up a whole slew and a whole spectrum of things uh, but one of the things that I'm gonna just focus on to share with you today is just money just one thing okay because it's it, it just there's so much in there but all right Gosnell, he was earning, according to one of the Wikipedia reports, on the average $10,000 to $15,000 a night. Can you imagine that? That's just one night. He, okay. And he had acquired about 20 uh, properties. And uh, in this movie, Gosnell, um, he was, what we see is, we don't know how the guy got from point A to point B because he hired a uh, staff that was untrained. He was uh, the, the legal limit of abortion back in uh, Philadelphia at the time was 24 weeks. You can't abort a baby after 24 weeks. He was aborting babies uh, late term. 
way past the 24 weeks. In fact, I think one of the babies was like eight months, uh, from what I understand, that, that he aborted. And the problem with his conviction is that um, he was delivering babies, botched abortions, they were coming out alive and then killing them, and so that was his, uh, his sentence. So how do you get a guy from point A to point B, and at the end, in his trial, he really didn't think he did anything wrong. He is so blinded, he, he didn't think he's doing anything wrong. Everything he's doing, he felt was good. In fact, I, I read one of the um, reports, and he said spiritually he feels he's fine. And I don't know exactly what that means, but legally he ain't fine because this guy has acquired so much wealth, so much properties, and today he's in prison. He's in prison for life, and um, something uh, something has happened, okay? So this guy, and I don't know, you know, but I'm just observing from a distance, okay? With that kind of money, and with that kind of properties, and as far as the morals that drifted him from point A to B, the money, to me, has had to be an idol in his life, okay? And the money had to be something that he was worshiping and, uh, and like again, idols will overpromise and underdeliver. So he might have been thinking he's got all these properties and everything, his life is gonna be wonderful, but where is he today? The truth of the matter is that can happen to any one of us. Um, idols will do that, it will destroy your life. Anything but God on the throne is a, is, is, is deceiving you, thinking that you got something great that you're looking forward to, and it's just gonna be a wonderful life. But if it's not God, it's gonna destroy. The enemy in John 10.10 10 says, I have come to do three things. We talked about last week, right? I've come to do, what were the three things? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. The enemy is only after one thing. He's out to destroy your life. And he'll do it in any way. But it's the temptations and the lure that's going to get you to participate with him. And then all of a sudden you got these, we got to watch out for these idols in our life. Yesterday afternoon, uh, interest, I came home and there was Lisa, she was lying down. And uh, I, I said, hey Lisa, I just want you to know that um, I appreciate you and um, I thank you for being my wife. And uh, you know what? As I think about it, where would I be without you, you know? Uh, I would be all alone. And, uh, and so I was just affirming my wife and just saying, Lisa, I just, it's wonderful. And, and, and then I was thinking and I says, Lisa, and you know what? If, if, if it wasn't for you, this house and this yard would look the same from the first day I moved in. You know, it wouldn't change. I just, I don't, you know, do all these improvements. And uh, she, she turned to me and she looked at me and she said, Clay, without me, you would die a rich man. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I turned to her and I said, Lisa, thank you for helping me spend my money. <laughs> but as I thought about that, God is good because to me, that's a safeguard in our marriage, in our family, in our life. Hey, I be, you know, you know, there might be some truth to it. I don't spend much money, you know. And, uh, you know, if I was all alone, I'd probably just accumulate all that die a rich man. And that could very much be an idol. And it doesn't help being Chinese, by the way, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, that was just... Uh, <laughs> But we got to watch out for these idols, and I tell you, um, we got to see this, uh, this movie because it was a true story in real life, but it conjures up so much. The other uh, idol we want to talk about today is uh, sex. The men have been meeting, um, Pastor Eli has really done a good job getting the men's ministry going, the women's ministry going, uh, getting the youth. He's going to do a, a, a young adults when he gets back uh, in November. And uh, for the men, we've been meeting every uh, Saturday for six weeks at a crack. 
And this last series, um, we did three series this uh, year. We did three series last year, and we got three, se three series coming up next year. But this year, uh, we're in the third series, and it has to do uh, really with idols. This whole series has to do with idols. So I thought it was really appropriate, um, you know, that Acts is talking about that. Yesterday, um, the issue for the men was internet pornography. Very interesting, you know. We had a Christian doctor come on, and he's talking about how the male, the human male brain operates. You know, a male is visual when he sees things just... Uh, chemicals are just starting to fire and the problem with pornography as they were saying is when a guy sees a certain image it's going to take that much more image to get the same um, you know firing of chemicals as it was here in other words the same uh, effect that you had here it's going to take this and then to get this it's got to take that so it's diminishing returns but it is a real danger all right and uh, so again, temptations are out there. The enemy is luring. All right. Two weeks ago, we saw this video, and a guy came on to his testimony. And I was sharing in my small group. I said, man, this is one of the worst nightmares that could happen to anybody. So it was a testimony of a guy. Um, he was a worker, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, one of the, the girls in his office or whatever was paying attention, laughing at his jokes and, and everything. And so he started enjoying that. And uh, he started emailing and I don't know. They, it, bottom line, they had an affair. And so as he was corresponding to his wife, uh, I'm sorry, as he was corresponding to his mistress, that email ended up in his wife's inbox somehow. So the wife saw that, showed that email to his boss, the husband's boss. The husband lost his job, lost his marriage, and uh, and I mean, and, and that was the story. So like again, the idols in our lives is going to overpromise, underdeliver. The enemy is using these things to tempt us, lure us to put something else on the throne other than God. And it's all going to end up in destruction. God's now. He's going to lose all his properties. And for the rest of his life, he's in prison. He's supposed to get the death sentence. All right. For this guy, he lost. All right. So we've got to, as far as marriage is concerned, you've got to, three things. You've got to, for the men, right? God has got to be number one. You've got to build your relationship with your wife, and you've got to surround yourself with trustworthy men. Uh, those are the, um, the things that you've got to get in place. So the battle plan for all of us. And like I said, those are only two examples of dozens of temptations that everybody, you've got to come before the Lord. You've got to uh, come to grips with some of these things. Because the enemy is just going to take you from point A to B. You know what Gosnell, yeah, by the way, um, how did he go from when he first started to how he ended up? And it reminds me of that frog, right? You, you put a frog in a pot of cold water and you turn it on warm. How do you cook a frog, right? So you put the frog in cold water, you turn it on warm, then you just turn it a little notch, a little notch, a little notch, eventually you end up with a cooked frog. The fr the, it's so subtle for the frog, he doesn't know the temperature's changing but at the end, the pot's boiling. And that's exactly how the enemy works with us. He desensitizes us, and that's why we have to have an up-to-date relationship with the Lord. Um, the battle plan for the men uh, in the class was number one, you gotta ad admit the struggle. Every man, you gotta admit what you're struggling with, okay? Because every man, every person, and we're not just talking, well, in this case, not every, we're not just talking men. It's everybody. Any Anybody that, uh, you know, has a problem with idols. You know, and we're all tempted with that. Number one, you got to admit the struggle. Number two, you got to identify the lie. Okay. And number three, you have to replace the idols with the truth of God's word. So it's not a matter of just sucking it up and saying, "Okay, I've got willpower and I'm going to resist this temptation." No, you have to, you have to resist it, but you got to replace it with the truth of God's word. 
okay? Uh, Francis Chan um, says, the more that you're in love with God, the more you're willing to do anything He asks you to. So, it's all about a love relationship. You have to be in love with the Lord. And uh, that has to be number one, because everything else will fall into place. All right? So, talking about idols. Let's go to verse 19, continuing the text. All right? So, we see how the people were worshiping Paul and Barnabas as gods, and they became idols in their lives, and that was a problem. And Paul, guys, just set them straight. Verse 19, we're going to look at the stoning and how they're going to be escaping to Derby. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. All right, so as we talked about it, anytime... Um, we're doing, you know, anytime God calls us to serve Him, there's an enemy that is going to be opposing the work of God. Uh, the spiritual war is a real war, and it is an invisible war, and we need to know how to fight in the spiritual realm. As Paul and Barnabas were out there preaching the gospel, the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. That's why I said, take a look at your map. So the guys from Antioch, way up here, and Iconium together, they all traveled down to Lystra where Paul was, and they were stirring up the crowds, and uh, then they started stoning Paul, and then they dragged him out. Paul was stoned so bad that they thought he was dead. And, um, and then the next day, I mean, and then he got up, and then the next day they departed. Um, to Derby, okay, so that's the city right, right below uh, Lystra. All right, let's talk about the subject of suffering. All right, so anytime you serve the Lord, suffering is very much a part of the equation. Like I said, when I was naive and a young Christian, I just thought, man, I'm gonna, you know, I received the Lord when I was eight years old, so I thought, boy, now that I received the Lord, man, my life's just gonna be all set. You know, no trouble, no problems. I mean, at an eight-year-old kid, I never had much trouble or problems. So I don't even know what trouble or problems what was, you know. Um, I think, it, yeah, people used to say when you're young, you run into trouble. But when you're old, trouble runs into you. And, uh, but anyway, that was just my uh, view of of my Christian life that wow everything's just gonna be gonna be great. But as I got older in my faith and more mature, I realized that suffering is very much a part of the Christian walk. Suffering is something that is um, I learned necessary and very important. Proverbs twenty thirty says blows that hurt cleanse away evil. And it's an interesting proverb. Blows that hurt, cleanse away evil. And when I came across that, I was thinking, oh, that's interesting. Because when we suffer, there is something happening to us. It, and according to that verse, there is some cleansing that's taking place when we suffer. So based on that, suffering is not all that bad. And suffering might be necessary. But it's interesting hearing it from a guy who doesn't want to suffer. I tell you, I, I'm one of the guys that I'll, I'll run, man, from suffering. I don't like to suffer. And, uh, you know, but we have to submit and surrender to God. And we have to trust, trust the Lord. James 5. We were doing Bible study on Tuesday nights, and we finished the book of James. And in James chapter 5, he mentions three, three kinds of people. One is the farmer, the other is the priest, and the third one is, the, is Job. And in this passage in James chapter 5, he's talking about unjust suffering. He says, when you suffer unjustly, endure, persevere, and hang in there. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. In fact, in that passage, it says the judge is standing at the door. So, 
Even in the book of James, it doesn't say avoid suffering, run from it. He's saying, he's instructing us how to have the proper view of it when we go through it. And it is to persevere and endure. Um, there was a movie I went to see, uh, maybe I don't know, last year, God's Not Dead, number three. And one of the things the guy was saying that uh, caught my attention was endure through the pain. And that was kind of the message in that one, endure through the pain. And as I was thinking about that, for Christians, we gotta encourage each other that when our brother or sister is undergoing suffering, we gotta encourage them to endure through the pain. Several promises we gotta keep in mind, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what's common to man, but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, and with the temptation, you provide a way of escape. So according to that verse, God will not give us what more than we can bear. Sometimes it seems unbearable, but that's God's promise. And if God is allowing you to suffer, you can be sure there's a plan and purpose and something good is going to come out of it. Now, I'd be the first to tell you that when I'm suffering, that's not necessarily what I'm thinking about. What I'm thinking about is how do I get out of this? How do I, I'm telling you, it's, it's interesting that I'm up here telling you, endure through the pain. But those are some of the hard lessons that God is teaching me. But everywhere you look through scripture, it's gonna, the Bible is consistent in teaching us the same principles. They're all telling us, endure, persevere. Count it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. See, there's something that is being produced in you through the trials. Blows that hurt, cleanse away evil. And we need to get rid of these impurities that are in our lives. Amen? All right, so let me share with you about the farmer real, real briefly. Farming is hard work because it relates to the weather, the seeds, and the fruit. Farmers are willing to wait so long because the harvest is worth waiting for. And by the way, uh, Danny just uh, gave me this this morning. Uh, this is now three weeks old. You know the radishes, the seeds we got three weeks ago. And so, hey, it's worth the waiting. But we're not done yet. This thing's got to produce the, the radish down here. So, not quite done. All right, but it's worth it. Uh, here's the secret of endurance and suffering. Uh, here's the secret of endurance when suffering hits. God is producing a harvest in our lives. He wants the fruit of the Spirit to grow, and the only way He can do it is through trials and troubles. All right, we gotta, we got to meditate on these truths. we gotta, we got to grab onto them, and we got to believe it, and we've got to trust the Lord. Okay, what about the prophet? What are the truths for the prophets? Number one, they were in the will of God, yet the prophets suffered. Interesting. Jeremiah was a prophet. Where did he end up? Was his life real nice and everybody loved him and he was they threw him in a cistern <laughs> all right um, the prophets were preaching in the name of the Lord and yet they were persecuted and a bunch of them got beheaded right all that desire the Bible says to live a godly life will suffer persecution and that's one promise that many of us don't want to hear but it's a promise you want to live a life for Jesus the promise is you're going to suffer persecution. But you got to make up your mind. Are you all in? And that's a question I need to ask myself all the time. And you need to allow your wife or your spouse to, to exam help you. Because we're so blinded, yeah? But we need our, our spouse to, to tell us the truth, you know? My wife's tell me, Clay, are you all in? You all in or what? <laughs> you know? So that's good. All right, number four. Obedience does not automatically produce ease and pleasure. Our Lord was obedient and it led to the cross. God does care for us when we go through suffering for His sake. And sufferings come from both the hands of Christians and non-Christians. And our patience in times of suffering is a testimony to others around us. So... We hear it from the prophets and how they were obedient to God's call and many of them suffered. The truth of the matter, they all suffered. They all suffered. And, and suffering is something that we got to accept if we're all in. 
if God is on the throne, if He's number one. If we're going to put idols in our life, we may live a life of ease as it appears. 20 properties, a lot of money. When they raided his house, 200 grand of cash was empty in his room. You can, but it's a deceit because it appears that you're having a life of ease only to catch up and destroy your life. For Job, what are some of the truths that we can learn from, from Job? Number one, you cannot persevere unless there is a trial in your life. Number two, no victories without battles, no peace without valleys. And number three, God has a balance, privilege. God has to balance privilege with responsibilities because blessings with burdens or uh, I'm sorry, let's try that again. God has to balance the privilege with the responsibilities and blessings with the burdens. Or else, you and I will become spoiled, pampered children. And so, anyway, we got to trust the Lord that He knows what He's doing. And we got to trust Him with our lives. That He's in control and not me. When you suffer, it is not easy. But there are promises in God's word for you to hang on. One of the promises I, I have hung on to comes from 1 Peter 2.23. 2, uh, and it says to entrust yourself to him who judges righteously. God is the righteous judge. When you feel that things are happening to you that are unjust and you're suffering unjustly. Entrust yourself to the righteous judge at that point. Entrust yourself to him who judges righteously. And when you do that, it provides for you some peace and comfort uh, during that time. God sees, God knows. And there will be a day where every knee will bow and confess Jesus as Lord. And every one of us will give an account to Him. Everyone. And the Bible even says for even every idle word that is spoken. Two examples I want to share with you today in the subject of suffering. The first comes from a compassion child's testimony that Lisa and I had an opportunity to hear at the hymn conference earlier this year. Her name was Micah Rose. Micah Rose was from the Philippines and she was there at the hymn conference in person sharing. And uh, she's uh, just starting her college uh, career uh, now. But she was sharing as she was growing up in the Philippines how she used to be picked on. And she remembers how she was being mistreated as a young girl. The school kids would, would mistreat her. And there was one time where they beat her up, kicked her, and uh, she got raped. And while she was being attacked, she was crying out to the Lord to help her. And as it turned out, the Lord did not prevent this from happening. She wrestled and struggled with that. Lord, how come? How come? And as I was listening to her testimony, I was trying to understand her struggles and her wrestling and she was sharing that it wasn't until later that she realized how much God had loved her and how much her intimate relationship with Jesus uh, came to be and she was sharing that she discovered that God's love for her was discovered outside of her box in her mind, God had to love her a certain way and do certain things. But in this suffering, she came to understand God's love in a deeper way. Powerful testimony. And, and she's just a young woman. She's going to law school. And she wants to help victims. And she understands God's plan for her life. And her verse that she was sharing was Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good. And it is incredible 
Suffering is not a bad thing. It is a normal thing for the Christian. We don't like it. But we have to be submitted to God's plan, God's ways. And um, if you're in love with God, you'll be willing to do whatever it is God asks you to do. If God is on the throne, you'll be willing to submit and surrender and yield, yield it to Him in whatever it is He has for your life. God has a plan and purpose for your life. I don't know what it is. It is my job to find out what it is for my life and to fulfill that purpose before I check in with my Lord. Because I'm only going to answer for myself um, and my responsibilities. I'm going to answer to how faithful I was to the calling. And uh, we, we, we need to understand. So from this testimony, it was just really powerful. The other one is Paul's suffering. Turn with me real quickly, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to, since, since we're talking about the Apostle Paul, let's look at the kind of sufferings he went through. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 22. Are there Hebrews? So am I. Are there Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors and more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And there it is, today's message is when he was stoned, chapter 14. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, uh, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, fasting often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, uh, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Um, who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. Verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. Amazing attitude. The Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. The Apostle Paul, man, I mean, I can't even remember all these things that he just listed there. And if just one of those things happened, you know, to me, it's like, man, that's huge. That's plenty already, you know. But God is sufficient. How was the Paul, Apostle Paul, what was his attitude? You know, what, you know what his attitude is right there in the next chapter, verse 12. He says, you know what? If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast about my weaknesses. Because he realizes that it's Christ who's doing it through him anyway. If anything is of worth, it is Christ who's doing it. But if anything he's going to boast, is about his weaknesses and infirmities. And you know what's interesting? He says, because when I am weak, it's right there in chapter 12. When I am weak then I am strong because Christ's strength is made perfect in my weakness. He is sufficient for your needs and, and my needs. You don't have to be all powerful, all smart, all strong to serve God. But it is through your weaknesses, through my weaknesses that God can use us. For apart from me, Jesus says, you can't do nothing, right? All right, so what is the purpose in suffering? It is to cause us to draw near to God and to get rid of impurities. Just like the refiner's fire. When we go through suffering, we get refined. The promise is suffering. Again, Romans 8, 28. Uh, God works all things together for good. James says, is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Suffering really is not a bad place to be in because several things do take place. Number one, intimacy with Christ. If your life is going really smooth and you're successful and everything's happening, how intimate will you be with Christ? How dependent will you be with Christ? But when you're suffering, you're going to find that intimacy with Christ. And Micah Rose absolutely found that. You'll be connected with your Lord. You'll be identifying with Christ in the sufferings. You'll have fellowship with Him in the sufferings. His word, you're going to find out, will not come back void. His promises are real and you're going to be drawing near to God. 
in this life, we're all going to, there's, there's no promise that we're not going to suffer. But when we do, we have, we need to draw near to the Lord. In contrast, we need to be careful when we are successful because there's dangers. When, when everything's happening, going your way in, and you seem to be successful, well, what is the tendencies then? The tendency is to rely on yourself. It, the tendency is to be puffed up with pride. And the tendency at that point is to fall. And it is more uh, dangerous when things are going well than when things are not. So there's a lot of good things that we can extract and exploit from suffering. The last section that we want to look at is preaching the gospel and making disciples. Let's go to verse 21 and finish up the chapter right here. When they had preached the gospel to that city and made disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed and fasted and commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended uh, to the grace of God for the work for which they had completed. All right, so what do we have here? <clears throat> we have the message of preaching the gospel and making disciples. We saw that last week, we see it again. And that is the whole mission of them going into uh, the Gentile world. Uh, they went to strengthen the souls of the disciples. And um, we just can't emphasize enough. Um, the great commandment is what? Love the Lord your God, right? With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the great commandment. What is the great commission? Preach the gospel and make disciples. Go into all the world and preach the gospels to who? Every creature. And again, Acts 1.8 says, You will receive this power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the world. We have the Nepal team who went to the other most parts of the world. Uh, we have Steve and Mumi who went to Japan and they're there now, went there to witness uh, to the people of her country, um, her native country. Um, and uh, so does that mean that witnessing takes place just by setting them out? No, this is our Jerusalem. And let me just show you, uh, well, just one story on that. Um, this past week, uh, I, I picked up um, Steve Kirk. Uh, I say, hey, let's just get out of the house. So we drove down to North Shore, and I was thinking, yeah, let's pray together, and then let's go share our faith. So we went down to Matsumoto's, and we sat there, and um, I'm praying silently, Lord, give us an opportunity to share our faith. And uh, Man, we're sitting there in one of those tables for kind of a long time, and I'm looking around, and half the people there are Japanese tourists. And uh, the other half were, you know, people, but I'm just waiting for the opportunity, right? And it's like, so I turn to Steve, and I say, hey, Steve, you know I speak Japanese? And he says, I only know 10 words. Sashimi, tempura. <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, we're in trouble. So anyway, soon after, we packed up and went home. But I just felt something inside of me saying, I, I just had to go share my faith with somebody. I just... So after I went home, I decided to go out the house and I was going to go to the park again, right? And as I was going to the park across the street, my neighbor came out uh, who just got home from a uh, trip to Yellowstone. So he was telling me all about it. So I was listening to his, uh, his adventures. And I says, hey, by the way, I got to ask you a question. Different, different subject. I says, Matt, when you die, you know you're going to go to heaven. He says, yeah. And I said, um, well, tell me about it. He says, well, first when I die, I'm going to go to purgatory. And then after that, I'm going to go to heaven. I says, Matt, on what basis are you going to go to heaven? He says, on the basis that I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good guy. And I says, Matt, you are. You're, you're, you're a moral guy. You're a great guy. 
But it says, man, but that's not the reason why anybody goes to heaven. Because the Bible says there's no one good, no, not one. There's no one righteous. So on that merit, nobody's going to go to heaven. And I said, Matt, I can share with you what the Bible says about how to get to heaven. And I shared with him the gospel that because of sin, we're separated. And only because of God's love, he found a way to bridge the gap. And only if we receive the gift, it's not because of anything we've done, but it's everything that he did for us because of his love. And if we accept this gift and open our hearts and receive him, he will come in and wash us from our sins so that when we die, we're going to stand before God in judgment and we're justified just as if we've never sinned because of Christ's blood who's washed away our sin. But it's a gift, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? But not everybody receives this gift, although God offered it to the world. And for the person who doesn't receive this gift, he's going to die in his sins and when he faces God in judgment, his sins remain. And being that God is a just God, there's somebody's got to pay for that. And that's the only reason why people don't make it to heaven. Because of their rejection of the gospel. I said, Matt, would you like to meet together? Also, I said, Matt, would you like to receive Jesus on that premise? He says, you know, I never heard that that way. But that sure makes a lot of sense. I says, Matt, let me, let me say this prayer. I says, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want to open the door of my heart and receive you as my Lord and Savior. And I want to receive this gift. Help me, Lord, to live the kind of life you want me to live. And I repent of my sins. I'm sorry. And help me to live this life from this day forward in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. I said, man, how does that prayer sound? He says, that sounds good. I said, would you like to receive, would you like to pray that prayer? And, and he says, yeah. And then after he prayed the prayer, received the Lord, I says, you would like to meet together? You want to, you know? And he says, okay. I said, well, what's your schedule like, you know? I said, let's meet uh, tomorrow. You know, what time? And so we met the next day. And, uh, and so that's basically it. Preach the gospel, make disciples. And, and, and the whole truth of the matter is, People want to know the truth. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. People don't know the truth out there. They don't know the gospel. 90% of the people I talk to on the streets about, are you going to go to heaven? Yes. On Based on what premise? About 85% of them say because they're a good person. You're not going to go to heaven because you're a good person. Because you're not good. There is no one good. You go to heaven because of receiving, because he is good and what he's done and receiving, only on that merit. So anyway, Matt, when we met the next day, he says, Clay, tell me, why, why did you talk to me? Because when you talked to me, I just felt so blessed. I felt um, like, like, how did that happen? Did the Lord send you to, to me? I mean, he's trying to figure, did, is this of the Lord? Did the Lord bring you home? Why did you share with me that? And why did you, you know? And I said, well, I, I, I just said, hey, I, I just want, I needed to talk to somebody. So I went out and there you were. So, you know, I don't know, you know, but, but he was really blessed. And, uh, you know, but I'm telling you, there's people out there that want to be blessed. And you're the ones who are going to bless them. It's going to take some courage. But when God is on a throne, you'll be willing to do whatever it is God calls you to do. And sometimes it's going to be suffering. You know, there's one lady that won't talk to me now because I asked her, can I share the gospel with you? And before, and she won't talk to me, you know, and, and that, those things will happen. But what I find, those are more the rarity, less than 1%, you know. But who are we going to answer to? We're not going to answer to anybody but the Lord, you know. One time, I just, well, okay, we've got to, just, one, one, one last story. One, well, yeah, let me just show you one last story. Years ago, years ago, I was really feeling spiritually attacked, down, discouraged, and I just really felt real bummed out. Really bummed out, you know. And my walk, you know, I was still trying to pray or whatever, but I just, I was kind of in a, in a cloud or something, 
this was a long time ago. And I remember talking to well, my pastor from Maui, I don't know, maybe I called him, I called him up, I think, and I was just talking story with him, and I said, hey, you know, I just feeling really junk or whatever. He says, you know what you do? I says, what? He goes, go out and go share your faith with somebody. You know, if the enemy is messing with you, go do that and see what happens, you know? Because I was feeling attacked and all kinds of stuff. And that's what started me on my journey of sharing the faith. So I went out, I went to the park, I shared my faith with somebody, and I tell you, I came back so pumped, uh, so full of life, and um, you know, sharing your faith, there's four things gonna happen. Number one, you're gonna be blessed. You're gonna bless the person you're talking to. You're gonna bless the Lord because you're obeying Him. And, and, and fourthly, you're gonna, have, you're gonna make an impact for all of eternity. There is nothing um, negative, nothing you can do wrong by sharing your faith. If the person doesn't believe and accept the Lord, that it doesn't matter. That's not why you're sharing your faith. You're just sharing truth. Uh, there's some. There's a handful of people. There's people out there. I share my faith. They don't receive the Lord, and that's okay. But it's a little one step closer for them to where they were, you know. And who knows? Maybe one day you'll see them in heaven. But the seed that you planted, you'll never know. Just like this plant back here. Okay. Um, and let's just wrap it up. Verse 27. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. All right. So what did they do uh, at the end? They all came together as a church and they reported all the things that happened on the mission field that God had done with them. It's not what Paul and Barnabas did. It's what God had done with them the apostles and they shared the wonderful uh, reports of what happened and next week Sunday we're going to be blessed to hear from the Nepal team and uh, I just by the way noticed Lyle is sitting there and I missed it man he's he's already back so he's one of the medical teams that came back a little early the rest of the team come back tomorrow hey let's give Lyle a hand hey welcome welcome back yeah just want to encourage you with that but next week Sunday the, the rest of the Nepal team uh, we're going to hear from them it's mission Sunday and it's timely with what um, we studied in 14. Hey, let's stand as we close in prayer. Worship team, come up, close us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth of your word. And help us, Lord, to not allow idols in our life. And um, to be wise and have ourselves surrounded by godly men who love us enough to help us. And to have a relationship with you and our spouses uh, in order. Help us, Lord, to have the right view of suffering and to understand that and also be bold and courageous to go and share our faith with the lost world so we pray in jesus name amen